Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are super excited to be doing the second episode of our summer webinar series with Dr. Annabelle Ford as our guest speaker. If this is the first time that you've been on a webinar with us, just know that your mics will be muted and your screens will be hidden throughout the presentation, just so that we can devote full attention to our presentation today. If you do happen to come up with some questions, go ahead and use the Q&A feature right there at the bottom of your screen. You can submit those questions and we'll get around to those um, after our presentations today. So my name is Sophie. I am with the marketing team here at Green Cover. We have been um, doing a lot of work this year on the First Acre program, which was inspired by the Maya Milpa tradition. So this program gives free Milpa garden mix to any grower who is willing to grow, harvest, and donate the produce to their local community. So in this program, we've been able to reference Milpa in teaching about the importance of diversity. And that's why we're so excited to have Dr. Annabelle Ford on today to talk a little bit more in depth about um, Milpa in Mesoamerica. And so, we got connected with Dr. Annabelle Ford in a pretty serendipitous way. We were thinking about how we could expand the project with local partners here in Nebraska. And so we reached out to our friends, Graham and Laura from Regenerate Nebraska. And when they received the email from us, they were actually on a, their plane ride back from their trip to Belize where they were <laughs> visiting Dr. Annabelle Ford and learning about Maya Milpa. So that was that was quite the coincidence. And from there, we were introduced to the Maya Regeneration Project, which is located in Omaha, Nebraska. So at the time, we didn't know it, but there are actually 8,000 people of Maya descent living in Nebraska, and approximately 2,000 of those people are living in Omaha. And today, we have <coughs> Luis Marcos with us representing Comunidad Maya Pisham Ishim. And he is going to share with us more about the Maya Regeneration Project, which is a proposed project, which is currently in its fundraising stage. Um, it is an indigenous regenerative agriculture practices incubator. So he'll be sharing a little bit more about that and you guys can ask him questions and learn more. So I'm going to now introduce Dr. Annabelle Ford with her formal introduction. So Dr. Annabelle Ford has decoded the ancient Maya landscape by combining archaeological research with traditional Maya knowledge. Ford studies patterns of settlement and environment, demystifying traditional views of the ancient Maya by examining the common human aspects of the civilization that shed light on sustainable farming practices. Ford is recognized for her discovery of the ancient Maya city center of El Pilar on the contemporary border of Belize and Guatemala. She has transformed El Pilar into a living museum and laboratory. El Pilar is a model of synergy between nature and culture, where Ford is applying a focus on cultural ecology or the study of the multifaceted relationships of humans and their environment. The co-evolution of human societies and the environment bring particular relevance to the study of Maya prehistory. At El Pilar, Ford is advancing pro programs that simulate Maya forest gardens as an alternative to conventional monocrop farming. Ford proposes ancient traditions yield contemporary solutions for the Maya forest of Belize, Guatemala, and Mexico, where she is tuning in from today. Dr. Ford's work transcends the archeological realm, entering the world of agroecology, environmental anthropology, and economic botany. Her innovative work offers an innovative approach to con conservation that is imperative to the survival of the Maya living history. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Annabelle Ford, and we will enjoy your presentation. Well, thank you. Um, can you tell me what's in your MILPA package for the, it's one acre you're, requ you're uh, requesting, one acre with what, what, what are the seeds that you're including? So we have over 40 different species and well, so the basis is this year we have a lot of sweet corn in it. There are also different types of beans. Um, we have different types of, I mean, maybe Keith would be a better person to answer this because. Okay. Well, maybe we, I just wanted to know. So 40 different yeah. plants that mm -hmm. are, are, are um, essentially spring from the American experience and not yes. a European experience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Yep. Okay, uh, how do I, I just turn, I do I, I, if my screen is shared, how do I make sure that my uh, PowerPoint so, shows? 
I think that you can just go ahead and request to share your screen. There's okay, that. Okay, let me see that part. Okay, share screen. Disabled, host precipitate, uh, uh, disabled. So. Okay. Okay, now try. Okay. Yes, it looks like I can do it. Great. Okay. <clears throat> Get to this part. Okay, um, I want to introduce the Maya Forest as a Garden. And in a way, uh, talking in Nebraska, which I hope to see in person shortly, um, when when we do when I participate in the Indigenous Peoples Day that is sponsored uh oh I don't know why that, is sponsored by Pishani Shim uh, uh, is is part of the Americas and like when I talk with um, with uh, local people in in Mesoamerica the Maya forest and I say well, they ask why I became interested in the Maya forest or the Maya in general and I said because I'm an American and I want to know what America's like but said no you're American we're not Americans I mean no you're Mesoamericans or you're Central Americans but the Americas was not named by the United States it was named by some yo-yo who called it Amerigo Vespucci, and I don't even know how it really came, but we call this place, which is also called the New World, partly because it was formed very recently, not because, you know, somehow Columbus discovered it. But anyway, we are in an American area, whether it's Nebraska or the Maya Forest or Patagonia, and the way people interacted with this region and with this area has a lot in common, I believe, and the, uh, you could look at what I'm talking about, the Maya, and replace it with, I don't know, the Omaha or the Chumash or whatever, because they were relating to their environment largely with the same uh, palette, we would say. Um, I, I came to this story, and I'd like to not say discovered, like uh, some people say, but I found El Pilar. Everyone knew it was there, but I found El Pilar largely because no one was looking away from rivers. They had the position that, uh, that uh, like in Europe, rivers were very important. Well, in this area, rivers are not important. They, dry, they become dry and low in the, in the dry season, and they become very virulent and and uh, threatening in the wet season. These are areas, yes, of course, they certainly, I don't want to say they didn't use it, uh, but it wasn't a major source of communication as, as may, it might have been in later, you know, med, after med, in the Mediterranean area. So, um, gosh, I, it, this seems to have a, a changing a, a, on its own, so maybe I did something strange with my thing. But I wanted to talk about how I, I found the site almost 40 years ago. And um, 25 years ago, we started establishing the boundaries, and this was both in Belize and Guatemala. And then we uh, created um, parallel management plans. And all along that same time, we wanted to look at the issue of succession and have the uh, this Kanankash, which is a model school garden, to try and build a, a link between uh, people like Narciso, the elders, and the um, new school, you know, new people coming up in life and expose them to some of the very important things of their landscape. Uh, one of the reasons why I want to do this is recognizing our common good. You know, it's our wealth untold. People do not look at the landscape. You know, I just was reading something about soil and uh, we're apparently expending our soil at a rate that in, I don't know, some dire things say in 10 or 20 years we won't have any good soil anymore. And this is largely because people aren't looking at cover. Now, I don't know exactly as uh, we would learn maybe more from Sophie and Keith and the people of green cover, but the idea of cover is under the shade and shade of almost anything is better than no shade at all. Um, and to recognize that culture is part of nature, that we are natural, we are nature, part of nature, and that we're always interacting with the natural processes and how we interact with them um, is either has positive or negative or even maybe in ca some cases neutral. And recognizing that there's different ways of knowing, and I think this is really important, that uh, scientific research can contribute 
but also local people who know their landscape have a way of knowing. We need to combine and recognize and honor all these different aspects. And what you're seeing in the side here is the changes over the years that I've been working there. And you can see what's happened is the expansion of pasture and plow, one of the more um, uh, aggressive approaches to land use and also something that was never used by any American because they did not have, uh, they did not have uh, uh, plows, they did not have metal, and they didn't have draft animals. So the way they uh, interacted with the landscape was looking for lands that they could manipulate and manage on a landscape level and with the kinds of tools that they had. And the tools that they had as they arrived were essentially those of observation, keen observation, and using stone and fire. And both these tools were, uh, allowed peoples of this landscape to um, adapt and recognize and utilize the landscape in a way, of course, that was not as impactful as the global world today, but, you know, definitely had impact. And they were adapting, coming in in the Ice Age and living into like the archaic, which would be around 5,000 years ago, was warm. So things, climate is always changing. We're not, it's not just now that it's changing. And these early um, occupants of uh, this landscape were very much adapting to climate change. Their initial experience was always one of flux from the Pleistocene Ice Age into the Holocene Archaic, which is called the Thermal Maximum, and later the settled, settled agriculturalists that were the ancient Maya. And I don't know if it will stay here long enough, but you can look at this model of distribution and you can see the Southeast, the Maya Lowlands, and California are very high density areas and predicted uh, areas for the early um, hunters and gatherers. Now, I expect I'm speaking to farmers and I think farmers are most concerned about the attraction of land quality. What would they would be first looking for are areas that would be fertile. And when we talk about tropical areas, we often think, oh, they're infertile, they're leached, they're terrible. And that's because the Amazon, a big uh, tropical area, is characterized by very poor soils. And to really show this, I had to go medium and high fertility, but really uh, in the Maya forest, over 50% of the area is really dominated by very good uh, soils that are, you know, largely mollusols, which are well-drained and friable um, and very good for um, uh, traditional um, hand cultivators like the Maya. So you can see that in an attraction that the Amazon would be less attractive than the Maya forest when you're thinking of, of farming. Now, farming today, you can see this very famous, this is a 19, late 1990s, maybe 2000 picture on the right of Mexico and Guatemala that absolutely is recognizing this corner of the Maya forest. And you can see that um, that uh, the landscape is very different in Mexico than it is in Guatemala. The population growth and use of the landscape is essentially pasturage in this area. Pasture and plow, but pasturage. And pasture, um, if it's maintained by the animals that have hoofs and, um, and eat, but also I've learned, especially in the Paten, that these people that have big ranches will actually um, use um, mowing equipment and these are things that are very very generalized and you can't select and uh, one of my wonderful uh, collaborators in uh, Belize um, uh, Alfonso Sewell says every plant is a recommendation and so just like you take a student or an intern or a person who's a volunteer as a or a new farmer you want to train them everything they're looking at is is a, a recommendation if that recommendation comes in good or bad or you don't want it or you do want it that's a really different way of looking at things now today it's a critical this Maya force is a critical biodiversity hotspot um, reduced in extent um, yet the Maya uh, are co-creators of this landscape. The dominant species are all useful. Uh, it's based on this milpa cycle that we are talking about, a management of forest succession, not as it's perceived a food source, but um, that is just one part of it. 
Um, it's uh, actually creating a landscape of utility, especially in the perennial component of forest succession. So this picture that you see below, um, and it will stay the same on, on, the, um, on my right, I don't know what, whether you're looking at the screen the same way, but the left one, I want to show how different uh, a landscape might be. This left one, the, the one that shows the pasturage or the plow was put together by National Geographic in the 80s saying that the, uh, the city monuments and the people kept the forest at bay. You know, when you keep something at bay, it's something that's really nasty. And in fact, that's not ex at all how, how the Maya that I know look at this landscape. They look at it very much as a dynamic. Hmm. I don't know why, I guess it's doing it. This is the dynamic. It goes from uh, from a bad picture of uh, not thinking of how the Maya, but where it changes all the time. And you have open areas and closed areas and succeeding areas, uh, all with utility for animals and plants, for construction. I mean, we have not just food, we have shelter. And um, these the shelter, in fact, half of these uh, dominant plants that are useful in the Maya forest are for different aspects of construction. And, um, and you can see that in the, in the list here. Um, of all these dominant plants, only one is wind pollinated. So when you look at reconstructions of, of the Maya forest and they're looking at pollen, pollen in, um, that would fly into uh, the, um, the lakes that we would read would really be something that uh, was largely wind uh, uh, projected. Now a lot of these can move in the wind but they won't be dominated by the wind. So uh, looking at uh, the landscape from pollen is is only one lens. You have to look at it from a number of them. And this is the example of uh, pollen as a window environmental change. Uh, what you can see here is this is called Ramon and remember Ramon is the only wind pollinated plant of the 20 dominant plants and you can see the change from uh, 10,000 to 8,000, this is this big change of the move from the cold, arid uh, uh, times, the cool, arid times, into the warm, wet times. So Ramon, as a, a megathermal plant, is really uh, a good target for understanding the expansion of the tropics. But as you'll see over here, it drops very low when we uh, move into the classic Maya period. And it seems very odd to me that people would think of this as deforestation because it's also the time uh, 1,500 years or 2,000 years of the Maya civilization growing and expanding and uh, dominating the landscape that we call the Maya forest. So to me, it's not a legitimate way of looking at it. I always was doubtful. Um, but they often said it became a savanna. But in fact, when you look at this, you compare the... Um, grasses, which would be, I think, savanna, and you compare that to the forbs, which are all the annuals and perennials that grow very um, fast and have um, lots of uh, wind-pollinated uh, regeneration. You can see that this is really the milpa cycle in, um, in, the, in the paleontological record. And that's really important to think of. Rather than thinking of Ramon as this forest signature, Ramon is this, you don't live by Ramon alone. And once you introduce the milpa cycle as a, as a plan of land use, you're going to be high grading or up, uh, putting up all of the uh, 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 wind pollination items that grow more in the sun. So to me, this is not a, a story of deforestation, but a story of, of the development of the Maya civilization. And that's based on this, the dynamic cycles of the Maya forest with infield, outfield cycle of short-term annuals, which will be more wind uh, and fast-growing perennials, which allow the, uh, the uh, succession to happen, and then the closed canopy trees for a, a, a sample in this example of a 20-year cycle. Now, you might wonder if the data that we're collecting today has any uh, connection with the past, but here is a, a statement of a 1552 ordinance by this governor, Tomás López Medel, which I really would not like to meet this man because he is actually saying we prohibited any milpas in the, in the towns. The towns should be, in like Spanish towns, they, they should be close to one another. It should be clean, thinking that uh, uh, having plants in your garden uh, is, is not clean. Without sown lands and without groves, which meant 
those had to be you don't legislate something that doesn't exist so we know that they had sown lands and groves in towns and if they found them they were going to burn them and here's an example of a contemporary maya um, house site you can see the milpa here and the forest forest garden in the back and the different kinds of ooh, different kinds of structures that they might have a outbuilding a kitchen and so forth which is the kind of complexity we see in the archaeological record now this is looking at contemporary polycultural landscape. You can see the infields that have are, are, are you know largely dominated by trees. Those trees you do find in the milpa, but they are small. They're uh, growing, you know, they're being nurtured, and so you can see the same things that you ha have in your home garden are found in the milpa, but the uh, canopy in the milpa is the um, is the maze, and with the nurturing of all the other plants as well. So this is a quick version of what you might find. This is a home garden, and you can see they're drying their chilies in the sun, but you can see the house and the forest gardens around the house. Fire. This man is called a yum ik, which is a master of wind. I always call it a fire tender, but of course to know how to tend a fire, and you can hear the stories of what's happening in California now, you have to manage the wind. And you can see, look at the, look at the smoke. It's not whipping away, it's going straight up. And that's a really good indication that they know and understand how to uh, manage fire in a milpa. Um, here's a, a setting uh, afterwards. It might look like a moonscape, but all look at the trees that are there and all these small uh, 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 low, low trees will probably re-sprout, hastening the regeneration of this area. They plant right in stone you can see why in fact the uh, map of um of uh tikal shows the area around tikal one of the biggest maya centers to be not cultivable and the reason why they're talking they're equating cultivable with plowable and something that's plowable will not be cultivable but you can see would not is, is different than cultivable this is this landscape here is rocky but it's got very good friable soil and will look like this very soon and you can see lots of different things happening here we have the squash and we have the maize and probably about 30 other crops this is an interesting picture too which i don't know it wants to go away um, this is looks like stalks that may be dried and dead but all of them are turned you can see that the maize is on the stalk they're being um, cut uh, broken and they're left there to harvest at a later time and these are beans growing up and i showed this picture to an economic botanist he said there's something else very important going on there too but i need to write that down so i can tell you more about it later then of course it moves from the maize field to fast growing perennials and today that kind of a uh, fast growing perennial will be in the context of a forest and the perennials in this case are a global uh, uh, plant and maize uh, instead of just uh, something that would have been native to the Maya forest. This is um, this is a uh, uh, plantain and banana, and you can even see the plantains and bananas still trying to grow in this perennial. This is a for uh, this is a more of an orchard, and I see you know allspice and and maize and citrus and other things that would ultimately return back to a managed forest like Chaco, who who is in his. Um, place where he says he's going to retire, but sadly he died last year. This is my um, animation of a milpa cycle at El Pilar using my LIDAR. I have LIDAR and the map, mapped area. This is um, uh, showing how the cycle might work. And um, the yellow would be the um, four-year um, maize field, and then the lighter green would be the first eight-year succession, and the slightly darker green uh, would be the final uh, mature canopy uh, that in an area that of course if it's too steep they would not be using as um, they would just be growing the trees so they become uh, a managed landscape in Toto. How are we honoring this Maya heritage? It's a big question you know uh, what was seen here uh, in the 1830s looks very different than what you would see today in uh, at Chichen Itza, for example. And I believe removing the forest and making up stories because, um, of course, here you can see well, this is what the person saw in 1830. Certainly in 1900, it was even more collapsed. What, how could it look like this? So this is, uh, I say, uh, uh, 
gravity not just a good idea, it's the law. So this is completely made up. And maybe it's made up with good ideas or maybe it's just made up. I mean, and that's why I even wonder about that serpent because how can you see that that might have come from this view? So here is Tikal. Here's Tikal when I saw it in 1972. And here's what you could see in 2000. Uh, by exposing and taking the monuments away from their uh, forest, which of course we're talking about neglect in the past, but why should we neglect now? Why wouldn't we leave the things that preserved it was the cool temperatures, the lack of salt coming out, and not attracting these biofilms that basically drop acid and uh, turn these, um, these uh, beautiful um, mosaics and, and, um, and uh, stuccos to, uh, to dust. My idea is that we would like to create monuments out of ruins rather than making ruins out of monuments. So I call them monuments, and I see this as a living museum designed to manage the resources of ancient Maya his heritage under the canopy with community participation, and in this case, envisioning a peace park uh, that would be a very different way of framing the monuments rather than um, taking away the, uh, the forest. And that's the way we are looking at uh, this in terms of archaeology under the canopy. The canopy is the very canopy that the Maya uh, nurtured over their uh, millennia of adapting to this, and it would actually create uh, an open museum where people could actually question and understand and appreciate the forest as well as the ancient monuments. How can this? Uh, how can we learn from these kinds of things? Of course, the temperature and precipitation is changing, and we know that we're getting great times of many, much water and uh, much rain and m less rain, and also that the temperature is increasing. And uh, what I think uh, forest gardens offer, and this is wherever you are, whether you're in Nebraska or California or in the Maya forest or right here in uh, San Cristobal, which I'm at 2,300 meters, it builds fertility, reduces erosion, lowers temperature, conserves water, and increases biodiversity. So to care for people on our planet. And that's what we should all be thinking about in how we use our landscape, because it's not just for us, we have people in the future coming along. So these, in the area where I work, I say they're heroes of the Maya forest who are ready to help, but they're all soon dying. And uh, uh, these, with every uh, departure, we're getting, uh, we're losing a practice. It's not just like an encyclopedia, you can't really understand how 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 to you can't look up in a it's not like a recipe book so much as a practice you have to be there and learn and understand so it's really important to be with these people and to create uh, avenues for succession uh, of these wonderful techniques you know Beatrice Waite is a um, was a, a medicinal herbal uh, midwife Leonardo Obando uh, Leonardo Obando had cows and uh, bees, so he had a very dynamic way. Uh, Alcario Cano, uh, had, his land was really steep and the uh, our agricultural uh, department wanted to take it back. I had to write a letter saying, have you been there? It may not look like it, but this is a beautiful forest gardener. And Heriberto Cucom was really into education, but his kids were not. So we wanted to do the thing that would try to help the, the kids to create a model school garden where no child was left indoors. This is a project that has ebbs and flows and of course had a hard time over um, the time of uh, COVID, but we envision um, uh, reigniting the interest here. And I've used um, forest gardeners to help uh, uh, create an example of an urban forest garden. And here is the little house that I rent as my brass base. And two years later, how it looked. Two years later, it was just uh, a completely different situation. And here it is sort of more or less today. And you can see on either side, there's no, there are no, um, no trees. But um, we have dozens of trees and many different ways of uh, eating and enjoying and even the shade keeping the the I live on an all-weather road my some people call it dirt road but it's all weather and um, uh, keeps the dust lower not out and so I really want to uh, promote the forest as a garden and using uh, El Pilar um, as an example to draw the uh, as a educational experience not just for tourists 
but also for local visitors and I think it really has done that. So this is what it looks like more or less today and my hopes that it, it may be someone in the future, I don't know if I will be the one, but will actually be able to envision what I have thought of as archaeology under the canopy. I want to give you a chance to uh, look at, I have a new website called Maya Forest, well it's not new, it's just renewed, a renewed website, mayaforestgardeners.org, which is really um, trying to bring out this story of the Maya Forest as a garden, and I encourage you to look at that as well as my nonprofit. <laughs> this is a, I don't know what I did to my uh, PowerPoint, as well as my nonprofit, Exploring Solutions Past, ESPMaya.org, and my uh, university, because I am uh, a scholar who is working at um, a university, University of California, Santa Barbara, and I have my more scholastic oriented component there. And I want to say that I'm going to be in, um, I'm having the privilege of coming to uh, Omaha, Nebraska. I don't know where you guys are, but um, uh, I will be there for this Indigenous People Summit uh, and would invite all of you to join and uh, find out what are the stories that are coming out of this event. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I wrote down several things that uh, I might uh, want to discuss with you later, just some, some things that I think you observed in the past that we can apply to the present and the future that uh, are just, just spot on. <clears throat> but before we get into that, and, and by the way, uh, for all of our people who are watching, if you have questions, if you have some things that you would like Dr. Ford to further discuss, go ahead and put those into the chat box or the Q&A box. Uh, we'll be getting to those here in just a moment. Uh, but before we get to that, um, I want to invite Luis uh, to come back on screen and talk a little bit uh, about what the Mayan community within Omaha and within the greater Nebraska area uh, are doing. Uh, his organization is going to be co-hosting the event that Dr. Ford just mentioned and talked about. So Luis, go ahead and, and just share with us some of the things that you uh, are doing there in Omaha and how it relates to some of the research that Dr. Ford uh, has done and is continuing to do as well. Well, I'm thankful uh, for this opportunity to join this uh, conversation uh, and with Dr. Ford. Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, uh, thank you, Sophie, for uh, inviting us here. And I will share a little bit about the Maya Regeneration Project. Um, First, Comunidad uh, Maya Pishanishim, the spirit of corn, we're based here in this uh, sacred land of the Omaha Nation. And uh, the Maya Regeneration Project uh, consists of a, a four-step process uh, that will take us to regenerative agriculture at scale. Uh, step number one is for us to plant our sacred seeds here at this Maya Community Center that we're renting at the moment. Uh, and so basically uh, to plant the seeds of corn, beans, squash, and our uh, relatives from the uh, north here uh, belonging to the Cherokee Omaha Nation gave us the fourth seed, which is uh, sunflower. Uh, we're planting our uh, medicines, uh, sacred medicines, and a lot of plants that have nutritional values as well. And we call it our community garden, uh, our garden of hope, uh, because what we really want is uh, to take this um, to a regenerative agricultural program at scale. Uh, so that's step number one. Step number two is to uh, secure um, the um, stewardship of this building, this community center uh, that we're now renting. We would like to, to buy it uh, and we are happy to share that we have reached our goal to, to fundraise for this community center. Now we're uh, going through the legal process of securing legal ownership and, uh, and stewardship of, of this building. So purchasing this building, which will be uh, the, number one is a sacred site for the displaced uh, Maya community here in, in the state of Nebraska. 
Number two, it will also be a training center for uh, future farmers, um, um, but also will be a storefront for products uh, from the farm. So step number two is for us to secure ownership, uh, legal stewardship of this building. Step number three, we're looking at purchasing uh, 310 acres in, in Lyons, uh, Nebraska. It's about 60 miles uh, northwest uh, of, 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 uh, from the city of Omaha, about uh, 20 miles south of, the, of Macy, Nebraska, the uh, territory of the Omaha Nation, uh, also about 40, uh, for probably 30 minutes uh, from the Winnebago Nation. Uh, so this, um, this 310 acres that we're looking at, uh, it is where we envision uh, to launch a full uh, regenerative agriculture at scale where we practice the MILPA system. Again, uh, take what we're doing here at the community center and scale it up uh, on 310 acres. Uh, and also add a um, uh, an agroforestry system with animal uh, integration. And so we have uh, done a uh, an envisioning session with the community, uh, and we we are very excited about it. Uh, and so that's. But first, uh, we have to uh, secure funding. Uh, to purchase that land, and that is what we're working on at this uh, at this time. And um, the fourth um, uh, step then is to actually implement, uh, you know, this uh, this regenerative agriculture program. Uh, again, the milpa cycle, buying the trees, uh, planting the trees, buying equipment, building homes for. Uh, the you know farm workers, but also you know a community uh, you know living. We envision it to be a center where the Maya can practice and go back to that spiritual relationship uh, with Mother Earth, which was very important for the Maya civilization. Uh, and but also will be a, a place where people uh, from different backgrounds uh, can come and learn from one another, especially uh, you know, with the academic institutions that have an agricultural program for our students to come and, and share with the community emerging techniques in regenerative agriculture, but also they can learn from our elders about you know, this ancestral knowledge and wisdom that is so relevant as Dr. Ford mentioned. Uh, earlier, it's so relevant uh, to uh, to the uh, problems that we are collectively facing today, which includes, you know, soil health, uh, water health, and how that relates to human health. Uh, and so, uh, it seems to me, uh, it seems to us that this needs to be a, a collaborative effort. Uh, we also envision it to be a center where an epicenter for. Uh, intercultural exchange uh, we aim to or we in the future would love to work with established projects or expand our projects in Maya territory, uh, both Belize where Dr. Ford works, uh, but also Maya territory Guatemala. And so this is the uh, the fourth uh, step in our in our uh, process and uh, so we ask everyone to number one, send us good energies and uh, prayers. Uh, but also there is, a, as Dr. Ford mentioned earlier, I think she shared the, the, the page for, for her organization where you know, people can contribute to the efforts um, by donating, but also uh, we also have uh, uh, our website. If you go to bishanishim.org, uh, you will also find a section there where you can donate to the Maya Regeneration Project. But, um, most importantly, right now, we're asking for good energies and prayers so that we can accomplish this, this, this goal of actually returning to our spiritual relationship uh, with Mother Earth. So with that, I thank you. Uh, thank the uh, Green Covers uh, 
organization uh, and also everyone involved like Safi and uh, also Keith and Dr. Ford for sharing time and space and everyone. So sending you just all good energies from here. And, and uh, thank you for being such a valuable partner in our, our Milpa Garden project. And I'll just, I'll just share just real briefly about that. Uh, you know, as, as a company, Green Cover, for the past several years, we've promoted this concept of the Milpa Garden, not, not the Milpa Forest, because this is a very short duration. But what we've tried to do is implement many of the principles that Dr. Ford was talking about that the Mayans would have been practicing for you know, many generations. But really, it's, it's the principle of, of there's great power and strength and great diversity. And so what we're doing is we're, we're mixing together many annual plants, uh, different types of squash and melons and pumpkins and, and leafy vegetables and uh, brassicas for, you know, turnips and radishes and things like that, cucumbers. And, and, and really what we're trying to do is we get that seed out to people. We donate the seed to them for free if they're willing to plant it and then harvest some of that produce and donate it to their community food banks, their homeless shelters, their nursing homes. And so really what we're trying to do is twofold, rebuild the soils by, by doing all of the diversity and practicing the principles of soil health, but also rebuilding communities by engaging 4-H clubs and FFA chapters and church youth groups uh, to get all that involved. So. Uh, the Nature Conservancy and Syngenta have partnered with us this year to help promote that, uh, that program. And we've been able to get more seed out than in the past. Uh, and we'll continue to do this. We continue to learn every year of what different combinations may work better. Uh, but Luis, I know we sent some to, to you guys to put in your gardens there in Omaha. Uh, is it, uh, how's that doing? Is it doing halfway decent or? Have you had the same tough weather that a lot of other people have had? What's, what's how's your Milpa garden looking? Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 a beautiful um, garden. Uh, I think we were trying a quarter of an acre uh, here with with Graham uh, and uh, at his farm, but also trying some here in uh, in our community center. So, but it's it's looking good. I think the youth is being introduced. Uh, to to the to the concept, I think we're trying to adapt to what's how things are being done here in Nebraska. Learning and just kind of um, you know allowing you know things to 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 just doing little things here and there until we get access to land where we can practice it according to our uh, our systems. Yeah, yeah, very good. So we've got a few comments coming in from the people listening here that, you know, they're having good success with the Milpa garden technique. And again, it's, it's, it's really just a testimony to the power of diversity. And, and Dr. Ford, if, if you're still on and can hear, I, I want to address something that you said early on, you know, that, you know, as the, as the Maya people would have been starting this, you know, they were very limited in the tools that they had but one of the most important tools that they had was, was the tool of observation. And, and I really picked up on that because what we see in working with regenerative farmers all across the country is the most successful regenerative farmers typically are the best observers because they, they look to see what's happening and what's going on. And, and observation is only really good if you're able to, <laughs> to make decisions about it. Essentially, you have to make management decisions, but you can't make those decisions unless you're observing that. So I, I really thought that was a great statement. And I think it's largely lacking in a lot of agriculture today, but the most successful ones that I'm seeing are becoming better and better observers. And just, just wondered if you had any comments or you seen other segments of agriculture starting to be better observers. <clears throat> Well, you have to be more of a smallholder. I mean, if you use mowers, if you use big machines, you're not going to be observing. I mean, that's, you know, at least at the ground level. But, you know, also, um, 
I think that observation is, is it can be at bigger levels. Um, uh, Alfonso tells me that if you, you know, he had this, he worked with agriculture and he had these sort of models that he gives you. So if you've got your 50 acres that you're going to lease and ultimately own, he says, don't start doing things right away. Walk around, see where the water accumulates, see where it drains get to know it, that level of observation. So you don't try to put something that needs water in a dry place and something that wants to be dry in a wet place. Uh, I think those are, you know, those are at higher order of observation. And then, you know, another kind of, I mean, the small level of observation, I, I have many examples, but I have that my little house with my forest garden and I, I didn't, I have one plant that is really, really grows great and, uh, provides wonderful shade but it's a, a southeast asian tree called they call it almond and it has a a, a, a fruit that then then produces something that looks a bit like an almond. It's really large and it's edible but it's not something i was going for you know a native um kind of garden and that i guess animals just move it all over and it's popping up everywhere and one time it was i'll say it was april which is really dry where i where i work and i I was talking to Narciso, I said, I think we should take that out. He says, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. The next couple of weeks I say, it's still there. Didn't you want to take it out? Didn't you think we should take it out? He says, Annabelle, it's the dry season. We'll do it when it starts raining. In other words, he saw it as keeping shade in that little area. It wasn't big, I, I, but he was observing and he kept it there. And like I said, Alfonso always says, you know, look at every plant that jumps up as a recommendation and the only way you can do that is if you're observing you know and i notice when i'm tra walking around in the forest with my forest gardeners is that if they don't recognize a seed or they see a plant they don't know they immediately are noting it and if it's a seed they'll take it back and plant it just to see what it is they say i think this is a vine and then they'll plant it and see if it's a vine so again that's that you're you're talking about how experimental you're observing you're going to be more experimental yeah and that's that's really important. Uh, Dale, uh, one of my colleagues, and I were just out walking in all of our test plots this morning, trying to be observers. You know, at that at that initial level, mm -hmm. and really one of the things that we really observed is how much better things did growing under the canopy, especially the cool season plants. You know, the you know the the kales and the collards and the turnips and radishes, where, where they're exposed to the sunlight, they're almost completely burned up where they're growing under the canopy of some sunflowers and some sorghums and other yeah. taller plants, yeah. they look great. And, yeah. So and they're, they're growing in the shade of something that is an annual as well. So think of yes. it as a can, I mean, it's sort of a shortened canopy, but yeah, it's really yeah. important. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I think that sometimes, you know, we think that we're so smart, but really we're just kind of rediscovering <laughs> some of these things that, you know, people would have known for generations and generations of, of how well those things grow uh, in combinations. Yeah, and like the that. old concept of weed is a real conundrum. In fact, um, uh, there's no concept of that in a, my, the Mayan language that I'm familiar with. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you, you, you have good plants and bad plants, you know, or plants you want and plants you don't, you know, so I don't, I mean, the almond is a perfectly decent plant, but I don't want it, you know. Or, you know, it, in that space, I don't want something that big. And uh, you really can transplant things, too, if you want, you know, so. Yeah, um, and I also made a note of one of the things that you said that there's, I, I think that you said that there's currently 24,000 plant species in the in, in the Maya uh, forest gardens. Mm -hmm. But that's less forest. than 30 percent, less than, or yeah, I'm sorry, the forest. But that's less than 30% of what it would have been initially. Is that correct? No, the area. The area. Oh, the not area. The, not the amount. We don't know what it would be. I mean, sure. in fact, you might, uh, someone asked, well, God, if they were selecting over 8,000 years, maybe there are things that are extinct. I, I could imagine. Because humans are pernicious. The Maya aren't any better than you or I are. We're, we're wanting to be ourselves fed and sheltered and we want to be happy and we want you know our kids to be happy or whatever so we're going to always be making decisions of our preference but it's just how you look at that preference are you looking at it in terms of you know how long you know like if you're looking at longevity of soil production uh, or looking at you know how how you need i mean think of this you know you need to have posts for 
making a house. No one, no Maya archaeologist is looking. I mean, they look at that. When I show that picture of, of what the, um, what the uh, uh, National Geographic was thinking, they weren't thinking of shelter. I mean, you have, and, and, and I've, I've been, that's been my latest uh, little project to try and see where you would get the plants that would be appropriate. And I don't know what the, uh, uh, the, lang the language of Luis, what he, what the, you have to have a heartwood. And that's called chulul, and it's like a, it gives something really strength. And if you put, if you put um, like a mahogany, we think mahogany is such a great construction. If you put that in the ground, it'll just destroy. It will just um, uh, turn to dust. It's not going to be a one that you want to use for beam uh, for uh, uh, posts, but you could use them for beams. So you have to have a plant that will have that heartwood. And that means not everything is that. So I had, you know, a list of, you know, 40 plants that were for construction. And I went over them with my, mm -hmm. my colleagues there. And I've all also found a couple of uh, books that start talking about this. And no one sort of melded that in. We always talk about, like, people, uh, for people, we have to have food and shelter. We talk about homeless. Well, you have to have shelter. So how are the Maya managing shelter? Because that is m as important as food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At one one small house, uh, or a house twenty by ten, would use ten thousand thatching leaves. And these people were telling me when they were growing up, they could find that within. I forced them. I said they it would just be out there. Well, would you walk a half hour? Would you walk an hour? No, we'd never walk any more than a half hour for our resources. So the resources were managed in that landscape. Yeah. I have one kind of final closing question for you before we have to wrap things up. But before I do that, I know there's been a few questions about will this uh, webinar be available on recording? Yes, it, it will be. Uh, we'll have it uh, on our YouTube channel here as soon as we can kind of get the post production work done on it. Um, somebody's also asking Dr. Ford if your slides will be available uh, are you willing to share those if people that's fine to... I mean you you've recorded it so I I, I don't have I mean, as long as okay. they give they don't say that's theirs you know <laughs> sure yeah so so we'll do that and then if anybody's interested in the milpa program that we talked about just reach out to Sophie or myself we can give you more information uh, on that as well so we'll be making all that available but uh, Dr. Ford, maybe just in closing, just talk a little bit because you're right. There, there are a number of farmers watching this. What, what would be the advice that you would give? You know, from the from the Maya forest garden information that you have known, uh, forest food system. How can that relate to agriculture today? What, what additional things can we learn and apply to make ourselves better producers today? Well, I think those principles that I mentioned that I gathered, you know, if we need to think of more diversity, people don't invest in stocks. They don't just buy Sears. Look what, what happened to them. No, they diversify. It's the same thing we should be doing with our food. And of course, uh, shade, you know, considering how, how soil is responding. I mean, if soil, the soil beneath our feet, there's that Joe Handelsman's uh, new book on, you know, the past, present, and future of soil. I mean, this, everything depends on that. So if we're not thinking of that as part of the regeneration and having trees in our environment, you know, have, using trees uh, because they are perennials and they will give you a lots of erosion. You know, I mean, how do we check erosion? We don't, uh, don't and, and looking at weeds as companion, I mean, we're talking about cover, you're talking about cover and you're talking about how different plants respond. Weeds are not weeds, they can be very important. I love the fact that amaranth is considered a super weed. In fact, that amaranth that's called a super weed is actually an edible. And I, I need to really understand, I've read a few things about it. Uh, I guess it's not for cows, so that's a problem. So that the, the so Roundup Ready soybean is for the cows, but if somehow the amaranth could be, quinoams were the first domesticates in the new world. Quinoa and amaranth, these, and amaranth was almost as important in Mesoamerica at the time of contact. It was just legislated against because it was used in certain rituals that the, the Spanish did not like. Um, but for every one carga of, of maize, it was two thirds of a carga, was worth two thirds of a carga of green amaranth. So 
uh, I'm just thinking, why can't we, I mean, if it has adapted to close down abilities to take in the toxins, this should be something we should celebrate and look at weeds as something is really important. This is a very important edible. It's got lots of protein. I, of course, like chaya better, but I mean, this is something that is growing, you know, is naturally growing. Can't we in, engage with nature and start, you know, using nature? And I guess one of the things that I really do worry about is how how we advantage the smallholder. And, and I was listening to one of these programs where um, uh, about uh, the new farm bill and how it, it doesn't, you don't have, there aren't any um, uh, insurances for smallholders and for people who, and smallholders are small, like this is, I mean, way bigger than anything I know. Um, mm -hmm. We should be, um, you know, insuring uh, horticultural products and encouraging local, local boars, you know, people uh, and you, and encouraging how uh, using a less footprint uh, for distribution, and um, I think all of these things are what smallholders tell us. And in fact, smallholders around the world are, are producing more food for more people than any other, um, uh, even though it looks like that different in Iowa, yeah. I guess, and Nebraska. But I think those five principles, you know, biodiversity, um, looking at erosion, building up soil, which are really all related, and, you know, conserving water. I don't know about how you're thinking, but, you know, water. Monterrey, apparently 60% of their population in Monterrey in northern Mexico are, are without water now. So, you know, we've got to be concerned about all these things. And shade is one of the best things for conserving water. Yeah, all those principles all work together. So mm -hmm. fascinating talk, fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, we will make sure that we we get the information for the program that you're going to be doing with Luis and Omaha coming up. We'll make sure we get that posted out on our social media channels. And if anybody has questions about that, if you can't find it on the internet, again, let us know. We can get you connected with that. And uh, it looks like a fascinating meeting. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Thank you, Luis. And uh, uh, we will be having another webinar next week. Sophie, do you want to tell us a little bit about what's coming up next week? Yes. So next week we're having Steve Groff on, and he's going to talk about the bionutrient meter that he is currently trialing with the Bionutrient Foods Association. And um, that meter can potentially measure the nutrient density of food. So primarily fruits and vegetables right now. And uh, we're going to be learning about that and hearing from him. So same time next week, 12 o'clock Central Standard Time, Tuesday. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ford. See you.